So hello everyone. Um, so this is the second part of the three-part series webinar on working with trans youth and their family, evidence-based practice for intervention in social change. So today's webinar is going to be about focusing on trans youth experience. Uh, for those who were with us last week, you will remember that we talked about basic concepts to try to understand uh, gender identity, what it is to be a trans kid, uh, and all the information that we needed to have as a base, such as, for example, the difference between sex and gender and sexual orientation and gender expression. So if you just join today, uh, I invite you to go back to the first one at some point and listen to it as well, because it's really important, I think, to understand all these different components. But today we're going to focus on trans youth experience. And uh, to do so, uh, we're going to look uh, a little bit at literature on the topic, but I didn't want to only uh, draw from literature. Uh, so we're going to also um, draw from two projects that are currently underway, uh, one in Quebec and one in Canada. Uh, I am PI on principal investigator on those two projects. So the first one is uh, called Digging Beneath, Beneath the Surface. Uh, an intersectional investigation of trans youth experience. Uh, this is a project we have interviewed 70 uh, young people aged between 15 and 25 uh, to understand about their experience uh, in a more holistic way and focusing specifically on oppression and resistance. So I'm going to talk a bit about that project, not in terms of methodology, but more in terms of what young people told us. And we're also going to refer to another project, uh, which is called the Stories of Gender Affirming Care. Sorry, there's a little spelling here, there's no T. Learning from children, youth and their family. And this project basically is uh, also a qualitative project that looked at um, children and their caregiver parents' experience when they are accessing gender, affirm uh, gender affirming care. You remember last week we were talking about medical transition. Uh, so some uh, young people will decide they will need uh, some, some sort of medical care to deal with their experience. So those can access to these gender affirming care where they can access uh, puberty blockers, for example, hormones blocker, uh, hormones um, um, affirming gender, sorry, um, <laughs> hormone therapy and sometimes uh, surgery when they, they are a little bit older. So we're going to look at their experience from that project as well. Um, and at the end, we should have a question. And at the end, you will see there is a, a couple of slides acknowledging all the teams that participate on those projects. Because to do a big project like that, we need to be many. So an overview of uh, trans youth. Uh, this is really a very short slide, but uh, we know that they are uh, vulnerable and at risk of suicide attempt. In fact, uh, a study conducted in Ontario by the TransPulse team um, found out that 47% of trans people aged 16 to 24 in Ontario who participated in their study uh, attempted, uh, consider suicide, and 19 attempted it. Um, this is a very high uh, proportion of young people. We talk about uh, nearly 47%, nearly 50%. So they are at risk of uh, suicide, uh, self-harm, and mental health issues. And they are also, as we see in the literature, more at risk to abuse and violence. And this can come from their family. Um, we're not quite sure why. Uh, there's not been research done specifically on that, but we um, can hypothesize that some family might find it difficult to accept the gender identity of their kids. Um, and um, actually, in one of the research in the digging beneath the surface, we, we found without wanting to, um, four young people in our first cohort of 24 that went through child protection services. So that, that gives you an idea uh, how they can be at risk. They're also at risk of intimate partner violence, um, cyber intimidation and bullying, and to several structural challenges, such as discrimination in employment, social isolation, poverty, limited health care access, um, adultism, so not being considered you know, old enough to make their own decision, and gender policing. We'll talk about those things a little bit more in detail in what is coming. Um, they are also at high risk of use and misuse of alcohol and other substances, and they are more likely to engage in risky sexual practice and rely on sex works as a source of income. 
um, to have access to, for example, gender confirming uh, surgery or medication can be very expensive. And when you're already um, discriminated in, in employment, it makes life uh, very difficult for some. Um, and they are overrepresented in re rates of homelessness, uh, they risk acquiring HIV, detention, incarceration, and in particular, uh, we see that in trans youth of color and migrant. Last week, we were talking about the importance of not seeing trans youth experience as a monolithic one, as understanding that there's a lot of intersectionality to take into consideration, so this is an example here. Um, last week, you will remember that we talked about uh, the experience of gender dysphoria. Uh, we said that gender dysphoria was a, a, a diagnosis from uh, the DSM, but that meant that it was an experience, a feeling of incongruence between the youth gender identity and their body. Um, so experience of gender dysphoria, if we look at, at, at research and the experience of trans youth in Quebec, uh, we can see that it's one and probably one of the only kind of individual difficulty that they experience. You will see throughout the presentation that there are lots of issues and difficulties and challenges that these young people experience come from outside themselves. But gender dysphoria is probably one of the only one that really kind of make them struggle a little bit more. And I've put two citations here, you know, one 16 years old uh, Young, young women who tell us that basically, you know, this is, you know, the, the important barrier that she, she, that's the first barrier she described to us saying that the fact that she cannot be the person that she would really like physically. So it show you that this can be kind of something difficult. And the other one is telling us that gender dysphoria put me in a phase where um, I'm very just like uncomfortable with my body. So I think it describes you very well, well, as much as we can understand for cis people um, what gender dysphoria can feel and you know i feel a lot of shame around who i am as a person i feel just like every kind of little aspect of my life is a struggle i don't i don't feel well so i wanted to kind of share with you some some um, you know some experience of those young people who participated very generously in that research um, we also know, and we'll talk about it a little bit later when we, we explore gender affirming care, but we know that uh, you know, access to general social care and health services are very, very important for young people, for trans youth as well, um, but they uh, experience some challenges in accessing them. In fact, uh, Ville, uh, Jamie Ville and Al collaborator uh, has found in their uh, study of uh, Canadian trans youth experience that 61% of them between 14 and 18 years old did not receive any medical services, uh, mainly because they had fear of rejection by the physician and 71% avoided accessing mental health for the same reason. Um, and here you see on the side, on the right side, uh, an example of a young person who uh, explained that they would like to go to a, a clinic to have a complete STD test, but they are worried about the pap test, um, which can be common for transmasculine uh, young people, uh, but they nevertheless still need to have those care. Um, so it's important that young people can access those medical services uh, easily and obtaining general health care in a welcoming and respectful environment contribute to their well-being. So we've seen that very clearly in our research. Um, what we see also is that um, accessing um, those, um, those mental health services when you've got a mental health challenge can make things even more complicated. So it basically exacerbates the uh, difficulty to access healthcare. And um, that came out quite clearly as well in our project, uh, where you had some examples, some young people who went to, for example, the emergency room for uh, a crisis because they were suicidal, for example, and uh, basically um, the person who treated them decided to take away their almonds uh, because, uh, because they were saying that they were feeling suicidal because of the almonds. So, I mean, we need to, to understand that, you know, you, 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 you've got a gender identity and then you can have mental health problems. <laughs> they are not the same, so you don't want to consider them as the same. Uh, I've put you another citation here from a young person who explained that uh, 
uh, they they went to see their uh, their psychiatrist and they were saying you know can you please uh, call me by my name and call me by those pronouns and the psychiatrist just said no 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 you know you're just having a gender crisis here because you've got a personality disorder so here again you see that someone with mental health difficulty were totally kind of erased uh, in their gender identity in trying to access uh, care we, uh, we see that young people, uh, so we're looking at uh, health and social care services, there's also challenges in other spheres, uh, such as the school environment. Um, a research from uh, Jean Berlin and Co. Uh, from 2011 in Quebec uh, showed that they are uh, experiencing still a lot of insecurity in school and that they are at high risk of dropping out of school. Um, school are places where transphobia and violence are frequently experienced. And, you know, my experience of working with schools and with different policies is that when there's no robust policy in the school board or when there's no, you know, at least a stronger formation from director, it becomes very, very difficult for the young person to navigate all of that. There's two uh, specific issues that seems to emerge from school experience um, and, and create difficulty for those young people. The first one is not having ID uh, that is consistent with the gender identity. We're talking last week about um, legal transition, about the person um, asking for a uh, change of sex mention of their birth certificate. So then it becomes, you know, a change on other part of their life. For example, the, uh, the school number. Um, in Quebec, it's a permanent school number, so you can't change that until until you get a, a, a formal legal um, change of sex marker. So this is making um, life very difficult for young people uh, to navigate because they, they get to school, uh, for example, and they will have their ID showing the wrong uh, gender marker. And you've got school that will even have uh, the gender marker on the timetable. So the kid is going to try to find their, you know, their room to go to their physics class or math class or whatever. And then, you know, kids around them will be able to see their name and their wrong gender note. So it's very difficult for those children to basically be stealth. If you remember, we're talking about being stealth or being out last week. So some kids who don't want to affirm their gender identity publicly, which is a total right that everyone has, um, they basically will be struggling a lot. Um, I don't know what's the regulation in all provinces, but I would say that in Quebec and in other provinces where gender identity is protected by the charter, uh, you know, young people should not have to have a formal legal gender change uh, on their piece of ID to be able to have their ID and their um, gender identity uh, recognized in school. But this is definitely a difficulty. And we also have a lot of difficulty accessing toilets and changing room. Um, so young people sometimes are forced to use the bathroom that correspond to their legal um, assigned sex. Uh, so that make a lot of difficulty. And what happened is that you see some young people not being able to use any bathroom for the whole day. And it can lead to, uh, for example, UTI, which is impacting on soul, on health. So these were examples of, you know, differential treatment that uh, young people can experience in schools. But in our research, in our research we also found that there were like specific discrimination, discrimination that was happening, uh, you know, in the relationship, for example, between uh, the teacher and the young person. So here I just wanted to kind of highlight um, an example uh, of how uh, discrimination can impact the life of the young person and can, and can basically, you know, uh, be extremely problematic. And this was in the case of a, a college student uh, who was not sure about their, their grade. So they went back to see their teachers to consider the grading. And the teacher uh, said, well, if you want me to keep calling you by your name, because I know what your legal name is, and because, because of the attendance sheet, you will have to accept my grade. Uh, I didn't say anything because I didn't want to be outed. I just wanted to graduate from the ninth grade and I lost all my friends. So I didn't want to lose all my friends again. So you see here that, you know, there's like an explicit uh, power relationship uh, between the, the child, between the young person and between the, the teacher. So I just wanted to highlight that sort of experience, which is still happening. This is a research from, this is data from last year. Um, there's other difficulties as well that young people experience uh, in other sphere, uh, family circle. Um, 
a lot of young people uh, may lose all relationship with their families. Uh, they will lose contact. As I told you uh, in the research on trans youth digging beneath the surface, we found four young people out of 24. We've not finished to um, analyze the rest of the data because we've got 70 interviews. So I can't tell you if we've got more, but you know, child protection trajectories were not something rare in that first sample. And you can see here that that young person say that my parents refused to see me. Honestly, it, if it wasn't for my sister, if it were if we weren't close, uh, I would never be in contact with my family. So this is a 16 years old, uh, you know, young person who has no contact with their parents at the moment. And there's some others that uh, so you know this is like worst case when the person don't have any contact with their family. But what we found is that a lot of them have uh, what we coined. Um, we called it the negative neutrality. So basically, they're not rejected outright by their parents. They, they, they still have some sort of support. For example, it could be financial support or the child could be allowed to stay in the house. But, you know, gender identity is not talked about. There's no kind of strong affirming support in the house. And here you've got an example of the young person talking about that. 19 years old, Valérie, is saying that it's not bad in my family to the extent that I don't get death threat. <laughs> To get me out of the house, they're not openly against my identity, but they, they don't deny it. But it is a subject that is not addressed between us. So that person um, and many other young person in this research was talking about experience where they are tolerated in the house, but there's no like explicit support. And for them, this is something that led to uh, experience of deny and its experience uh, of um, the opposite of well-being, so uh, distress. <laughs> Well, we've been talking about a lot of struggle that young people experience. Obviously, there's a lot of resilience as well. I think we want to acknowledge that. Uh, trans youth are very, very resilient. Um, beyond the psychological resiliency, which would be individual to every young person we work with, um, there's some aspect that seems to be making them more resilient. For example, the capacity to define their own gender. So we know that young people who are able to define their gender uh, be honored for the name they choose, be honored for the pronoun they choose, the, the, the gender they choose, they, they feel much better. So, so it really improves their well-being. Um, also to be able to reframe their, men, their mental health challenges. Uh, what does that mean? Is that uh, young people who are able to, to say, you know, I am like that, this is my understanding of my mental health problem, it's very helpful for, as, for them as well. So it's, I think it's basically getting out of those boxes and those labels. Uh, to find access to supporting services and trans-affirming communities, it's important, as well as uh, family acceptance and social support. And when we talk about family acceptance, we're talking about like strong support. In fact, it is key to optimal development of trans youth. Uh, when they supported their depression and anxiety, is no higher than cisgender children. So what Derwood, McLaughlin and Olson did is that they look at, you know, um, stress and anxiety scales. And they did like a survey of trans youth who were affirmed by their parents and supported strongly and cisgender children, um, you know, who were also affirmed by, them, by their parents. And basically when you compare their rate of anxiety and depression, it's no higher. So there's just like a marginal, like slight little kind of, difference in terms of, of, of stress, but, you know, it's, it's nearly the same. So it shows us basically that you know, when a child is affirmed and supported by their family, it's really very, very doing well. Uh, suicide, self-harm and depression rates, along with other indicators of mental health issues are lower for trans youth who receive support from their parents uh, than those who don't. And, you know, that uh, trans pulse study that come from Ontario, um, showed that basically uh, suicide rates, you know, that uh, 40 and above, 43%, 47%, depending on the statistic you look at, uh, will drop considerably, about 93% drop for young people who are supported, who's got strong support by their parents. So it's a real strong supportive resilience factor. Um, it is also, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, I've uh, repeated that, that point by Derwede and Cole, but it's also uh, family support is really uh, important to uh, counter isolation. Um, so here you've got like a young person saying, my family is always helping me. 
they will always be important to me. I'm someone who has a hard time staying in touch with people, but my family is always there. Of course, things would not be going so well for me if they had not accepted me. So you see someone who's like having a little bit of difficulty making friends to go back to their family is a real source of support. And what we've seen is that uh, family can also be a really great source for uh, advocacy. Uh, so you've got young people telling us that their parents have not put any citation here, but parents, you know, went with them and advocate for them in schools. And it's really helpful. And it helped them to cope with the discrimination and negative effect on mental health. So we're talking about gender affirming care uh, last week. As I said, uh, the transition, whether it be social or legal, can alleviate gender dysphoria. Uh, but when you have access to gender affirming care model uh, in terms of medical, it also helps. We need to remember that this should be the decision of the young person. So, you know, not every young person will decide to have access to uh, medication, to, you know, to medical support. But those who want to have it, they should have access to it um, widely. Um, in fact, uh, a research I wanted to, uh, to cite here, I mean, it's a collection of research, but it's all from the same team. Um, talking about in the United States and the Netherlands, they demonstrated that access to hormone blockers, hormone replacement therapy and surgery as needed, improve medium and long-term care outcome for transgender youth in adulthood. So this is data we've got. So we know that this gender affirming care is very, very important. Um, in our research uh, in clinics, so we're looking at the uh, experience of um, children who access clinic to have access to those uh, almond blockers and almonds and eventually surgery. Uh, this is a project that look at three clinics, just to put you into context. One in Montreal, one in Ottawa, and one in Winnipeg. And um, so we looked at, uh, at their experience and, and basically um, we know that uh, we're starting to understand that uh, seeking gender affirming care to start with was often raised by a parent or a professional. So when we see in the media, oh, young people, they just see things online and they want to go to access almonds. Well, the research say that actually it was more of a reference that they got from other uh, people. Um, and here you've got a young person explaining us, to be honest, I forgot how, but I remember my mom and I talking about the next step. At this point, it was still very unsure. And so my mom had the idea that we could talk to someone. I talked to many different people who had uh, more knowledge than me. Maybe they could help me, guide me and in track and I'm trying to get. And so she found a place here. And so I came here and I met with the doctor, the intake nurse. That was awesome. So that's a 14 years old uh, trans male, trans masculine uh, boy who is explaining how, you know, just to be able to access that clinic was, you know, important for them. Um, we found some participants that first brought their idea to their parents. Um, so out of 35 youth, it was six of them. They were all trans male. Um, but we need to also remember that between the time that the person uh, is talking to their parents and doing a coming out uh, and the person that realize about their gender identity, there's often a big gap. There's a big gap of time because it takes time for the young person to do their coming out. Uh, it's, it took several months to a year from the first moment that they first told their parent about their gender identity until their first appointment with a physician at the clinic. And by then, many had a clear idea of what intervention they wanted. So when they get to the clinic, they say, OK, I, I really need to have access to blockers now. I need access to blockers. Well, often we need to understand that the process getting to the clinic has been a long one. Um, you know, the first hurdle is to talk to your parent about that. And the second is to kind of make sense of your own gender identity. So we need to understand that it's a really long kind of winded process. For those who had access to uh, medication, we can see that uh, there's really positive outcome. Um, feelings of happiness about physical effect from the medical intervention was noted uh, in, uh, in all young people. Uh, they alleviate anxiety and made the, feel, uh, the youth feel like they were moving forward in the transition. So I've put three citations. I think we, we can never have better than the, the voice of young people themselves. But here, you know, we don't have them. So, um, so ever since uh, we got the referral, we came to the gender identity clinic and things have been really going great. I'm really happy with my skin. So that's a young person who's been able to access to, uh, to treatment. 
I realized that I accepted myself much more and that it feels much less bad looking at myself in the mirror after, after taking blockers. Remember that blockers don't really do anything. They will just put a, a, a stop on puberty. So it's not going to undo things that, you know, already happened with the body. But just to be able to have access to something like blockers really seems to be taking a lot of anxiety away from those young people to know that things are not going to carry on to develop. Um, and then you've got like a 16 years old who say, since I was around seven, I would hit my arm again wall and stuff because I was just really unhappy. And it's better now. I am on testosterone because I'm kind of feeling content, like things are going to get better. So it hasn't been bad for quite a while. So you can see that having access to, um, having access to um, gender affirming hormones here has really made uh, an improvement again to the life of that young person. Um, their experience at the gender um, affirming clinic um, have been positive um, overall, I would say. Um, and what came to young person who were asking them why is it positive is that uh, the staff always use the correct pronoun. And this is something uh, specific about gender affirming care is that they are clinic that are working with trans youth. So they used to work with trans youth. So obviously using the right pronoun, using the right name is something that is uh, more common than when you go to general uh, general health care or social care. But you can see here that this is something that was raised as very important for those young people. Uh, they say that many staff were helpful, giving them access to medical intervention, understanding their gender. Uh, they felt heard, welcome, validated, cared for. Uh, you see here uh, a young person, 16 years old, say uh, it was helpful because talking to someone who knew about a lot of stuff, more than Google could give you, is helpful. Because what we see is that young person, when they start feeling something, often they will go on Google. My thought here is like, who doesn't go on Google to check things out, yeah? <laughs> so young people do exactly the same. So they go on Google and they try to find things. But what they realize is that when they get in clinics, you know, there's so much more knowledge and they can really make sense of what's happening. So uh, they really make you feel good about your decision and help you realize what you really want. So it's nice. There's been frustration, uh, however, um, long waiting time. Um, sometimes it's waiting time because of waiting list. Uh, we're talking about very specialized clinic here. So there's not a, a lot of them around. Uh, so sometimes there's a lot of people waiting and sometimes there's protocol restriction. I have not put any citations here, but there's some young people who wanted to access blocker, for example, but the clinic wouldn't provide blockers before a certain age or a certain stage of development. Same for almonds. So protocol restriction was frustrating for them because sometimes they felt they need it, but they couldn't have it because doctors were following protocols. Um, there's been sometimes discomfort about some question. I've put that because I think it's important that we remember that as social workers, that when we are with young people, you know, young people may feel uncomfortable with the question we ask. So if you have to ask question, I mean, always ask yourself, do you need to ask a question? But if you have to ask a question, always trying to put it into context um, so that the young person can understand why you're asking that question. Uh, Sometimes they felt that they had to convince the staff that they are trans. So that is less, uh, that is less good. Um, as we're saying, you know, we need to, uh, we should be, uh, you know, we shouldn't be arguing with someone's identity. There's only the person. I don't think that these young people had the experience of being argued with, but by the sort of question they were asked, they felt like they had to prove before being able to access. And some staff has limited understanding of non-binary youth. We've not talked so much about those non-binary youth. There were lots of questions about them last week. But, um, you know, some, some staff have limited understanding. Uh, and actually, there's a, a really interesting project being done in Quebec uh, on the decision-making process of doctors who are prescribing hormones to non-binary use. So we'll be able to know more about that very soon when that data is analyzed. Um, has there been any second thoughts or regrets in taking those almonds? So, uh, no. Uh, even those youth who had more serious side effects uh, from taking those medications were empathic that medical transition were the right, right choice for them, uh, though they had questioned their decision in the past. So, this is really good because, you know, another uh, preconceived idea some people have is like, oh, yeah, those young people access those almonds quickly and they don't reflect about it. And, you know, what we see is basically from the research is that those young people, they are in reflection. They, they think about it. You know, they, they, there's a long process going on. And even when you've got like, you know, side effect, un undesired second 
secondary effect, it's still the right thing for them. Um, and uh, I don't know if it's something that interests you, but some of them add some um, some effect. I mean, the yeah, I mean, hot flash. Uh, it could be like uh, yeah, that that was one of the main one. Um, you know, mood mood swing. Um, that's the sort of effect that they could get. But uh, basically, you know, this young person is telling us that the time of my suicide attempt was one of the, my most strong part where I was like, okay, what if I'm a lesbian, you know? And what is, if all of this is a mistake? But then eventually everything stabilized and I was like, but I'm so much happier, come on. I would, that wouldn't make sense. I feel like it would be difficult if I change my mind because I, I've come so far, but honestly, I personally don't think it will happen. So, so basically, you see that the person was really kind of questioning their own identity. And is that the right thing? And yes, it is the right thing for them. And they even say at the end, you know, it's okay. I've read about people who detransition and it's perfectly fine. So that person is really conscious about that, but still is the, the right course of action for them. And a majority had never questioned their decision. And those who said that they had doubt about it has been fleeting. So I had little moment where like, what am I doing? Is that something serious? But then I look at the mirror and listen to my deeper voice. And I'm like, this is what I want to do. So the preliminary conclusion of that research, because we're still analyzing data. And next week, I'm going to talk about parents' experience. I'm going to draw from the same research because we talked to parents and caregivers in that research. But for the young person, I would say that the vast majority of youth describe their experience of accessing medical intervention and gender-affirming care uh, at the clinics in positive terms. Uh, they, they describe improved well-being, uh, the frustration more and more frequently concerned with delays in accessing uh, care and intervention, uh, that non-express regret and that, you know, the results are coherent with data from limited existing literature, uh, with one mark exception, is that all youth said that gender uh, affirming care staff always use their prefer pronoun and noun. Because in literature, we see that uh, often young people who access care, they feel frustrated because people don't use those. So in our research, everyone was using the right name and pronoun. So that was really positive for those young people. If we turn into intervention, and then uh, I'm going to uh, open the floor for question. But if we look at intervention, I think regardless of the setting, um, affirming the young person's identity, listening to them, asserting their identity is what's considered as best practice. Uh, remember that treatment that attempt to change gender identity or gender expression is uh, basically unethical. This is a strong statement from the World Professional Association of Transgender Health and that from the American Academy of Pediatrics says that recent and rigorous research suggests that instead of focusing on the question of what will happen to a child, accepting them for who they are, even at young age, help them to develop a secure bond of attachment and resilience, not only for the child, but also for the family. And you can see here that basically... Um, this is a, a really important thing. I'm just going to plug my computer. It can't go without any itch. So. <laughs> Last week it was a dog. There you go. Oh. And then uh, don't forget to respect the name and pronoun uh, affirmed by the young person, supporting the different form of transition. Um, in social work, this could be through writing letters. Uh, some provinces will ask uh, for a letter of support to be able to do a gender, um, a legal change of a gender marker. So it could be writing letter of support to vital statistics or birth registration office, uh, you know, writing reference to specialized service or for school when necessary. So this can be uh, things that we can do as social workers and also know the available resources and refer when needed. For organization and institution who might be in contact with trans youth for working with them, it's about remembering that only the person can define and affirm their identity and putting in place structure that can accommodate that and honor the person's identity. So often we get, I didn't give an example of that today, but sometimes we get a, a young person going to an organization and say, you know, this, you know, I'm Annie, I want to be called her. And the organization will say, well, you know, unless you do the legal change, we can't do anything for you. Well, we should be doing something. We should try to, you know, change system and make sure that we can have, a, you know, usual name and, you know, a note on pronoun that the person wants to add. Because there's nothing more um, 
intimidating for a young person than having to go to a medical clinic and waiting in the waiting room and getting a doctor calling you by the wrong name and the wrong pronoun in front of everyone. So we need to really think about that as organization um, and attending training on the reality of trans people. It's really important to be able to uh, understand knowledge and uh, updated evidence. For communities, I think it's about offering uh, space for solidarities and sharing, both online and offline. We didn't talk a lot about it, but young people really benefit from accessing uh, other young people and being able to talk. Uh, ensuring that trained resources if it's available in certain space in order to facilitate the sharing and discussion and organize activities that allow various trans youth communities to share their needs and concern with each other. So this is the acknowledgement for the story of gender affirming care. It's a project, I will just name it, funded by the uh, CIHR. And this is the team of this uh, Digging Beneath the Surface project, which is funded by the Social Science and Humanity Research Council. So I don't know if you've got any questions. Um, so thank you so much, Annie, for this presentation. And we are, um, it's time for the Q&A period. Um, I'm your moderator today. I'm Sally Guy. I'm the Director of Policy at the Canadian Association of Social Workers. And I'm looking at the stats, and most of you in the audience are back from the first event. Uh, but for anyone who's new in the audience, the information you need, like how to access this slide deck, download that, um, where to get your, your certificate of attendance, um, those kinds of details are in the welcome widget when you uh, logged on, but you can access it by clicking on the loudspeaker icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, also, uh, if you are new, you can read Annie's full bio um, on the right side of your screen. It's posted. I also just quickly want to note before we take questions, and we have a bunch coming in right now, which is awesome. Um, at the end of the presentation, a survey is going to pop up right away. And once that happens, you're not going to be able to go back in to access your certificate or download the slides if you hadn't already. But uh, never fear, within 24 hours of the presentation concluding, you're going to be sent a link to your email to um, get into the recorded version, and you can pop back in and download the slides um, or access the, any other resources. So that's to say, if you forget to do it before the presentation ends, don't worry, you will get a link to log in. So with that said, I have questions coming in, uh, and let's get to some. So Annie, lots of people are asking about terminology. Um, so for, I think some of this is because of, of just translation, and thank you for doing this presentation in your second language and uh, translating a lot of it yourself from French. But if people are asking, they've seen the word uh, transmascul transmasculine or transmasculine, je pense, uh, on the slides, as well as transgender male. Um, does that mean the same thing? Which one is correct? And then ah. another person is asking, I was recently informed that it's not okay to say transgendered, um, that the word is transgender. So basically, can you just talk to us about what the what the correct terms are um, and, and how to know what to use? Okay. Um, so on the slides, um, there's two sets of way of talking about young person. When it refers to the um, digging beneath the surface, so the first few slides, we decided uh, as a team to honor the way that the person were describing themselves. So basically, right. if you see... Um, I can't remember the name of the Jeanette, 16 years old girl. It's because when we say, hey, Jeanette, you know, can you tell us about your gender identity? They say, I'm a girl <laughs> and I use she pronoun. So, so this is, you know, how we work. For the um, story of uh, uh, gender affirming care, we just put towards trans masculine or trans feminine. Uh, it's another way of categorizing them because we had a different um, social demographic uh, questionnaire. But basically, I think uh, the bottom line is to uh, use the term that the person prefer. Um, you're right saying transgendered is not, uh, it's not, it's not right. Uh, transgender is not a noun, it's an adjective. Uh, so it shouldn't be used as a noun because um, some trans people will say that it, um, it has an effect of uh, dehumanizing them. So, so we should use transgender or trans, just trans as, as, as an adjective. So a trans person, a trans youth, mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. Uh, so that's a really, really good question. Um, for the rest, as I said, you know, if we wrote trans masculine or trans feminine is because we wanted to, uh, you know, mention that they are trans youth and they 
identify more towards the feminine spectrum or the masculine spectrum, although we had some non-binary uh, young person in that sample as well, but I didn't cite any of them. And otherwise, you know, the other citation are just how people describe themselves. Hmm. And actually we had in that uh, project, Digging Beneath the Surface, we had probably as many ways of describing yourself as participant. <laughs> We asked them, you know, how do you describe yourself in terms of gender identity? And we had such a wide range of way of describing yourself. So, you know, when we ask, we have so rich answer. Instead of That's, ticking boxes. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, uh, there was lots of questions about that also last week. So I'm, I'm glad that you were able to touch on that. Um, on one of your slides, uh, you said that you recommend getting training on uh, the realities of trans of trans youth, and just wondering, was, was there any specific organizations or like websites or resources that you would want to direct people to for that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, in terms of Canada wise, um, in terms of, I mean, you can always contact. Um, and I'm going to declare conflict of interest here because I was co-founder of that organization. But if you are really lost, you can always contact Gender Creative Kids Canada. They can probably help you to kind of identify the, you know, a resource. Uh, but apart from that, there's quite a lot of resources I'm thinking about. Um, but I don't know who's offering training across Canada, actually. Hmm. Um, I would be careful. I would, I would inquire if I was you, you know, before booking a training. You know, what's your perspective? What's your perspective on, on trans, you know, on trans, uh, you know, on trans training? Are you abiding by the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, for example? So I would be curious before booking something. Since I can't recommend something, just make sure that the training you're getting is one that fits within the standard of care. Because as we were saying last week, there's still people who could uh, not. Um, am I still there? I've lost my complete. Okay, yep. sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, my screens keep, uh, I don't know why, but my screen keep uh, flipping, so I can't see you anymore, but if you hear me, that's great. Um, no, I, hear, I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> okay, um, so, so yes, I would just make sure that uh, basically, you know, the person giving the training are themselves trained by a recognized organization such as the Canadian Association of Transgender Health mm. or the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. So I'm sorry to not be so specific today, but I don't know all the resources in Canada. No, I, I think that's a, a great uh, piece of advice for people going out and seeking their own training for either themselves or their organizations, like, like being attentive to the perspective that's being brought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this one might be a bit too early childhood development or a bit too psychology for you to answer and just say so if, but we had a couple questions like this. Um, what age do you think a, a, a child's brain development is at the level where they are able to make, you know, informed decisions about their life or about their gender? Um, and then they add, many children with whom I have contact in my work would love to change the circumstances of who they are or where they live. Um, and then the caveat being like, you don't come into contact with a social worker that often if your life is great. Um, so I think the question is sort of, how do you know at what age, um, when a kid is saying they're trans, how do you know if that's authentic? Okay. Um, well, I would go back to a little bit what we said. I mean, for all question of identities, the only person that you can trust is the person who is affirming their own identity. So there's no, you know, there's, there's no test. There's no, there's nothing we can use. And, but I think the question is not that the question is that we shouldn't be testing someone's identity because it's only the person who can affirm it. So I think that that's the bottom line. So even if you've got like a two, three, four, five, six years old who say, you know, I, I am a, a girl or I'm a boy or I'm both or, you know, I think what you need to do is really to follow the child's lead and, and stop focusing on what they will become, but more what they are at the moment and what they're telling you that they are at the moment. Um, you know, it's, it's just going to make them feel validated for who they are. Uh, to be able to affirm them like that. And, you know, if it's a phase, it's going to go away. <laughs> if it's not a phase, you will have started to kind of put uh, some really kind of strong uh, seed of resilience in that kid. Because society, you know, if we are worried about like influencing a kid to think in a way, I would say that society in general influence everyone to think in some ways in terms of gender. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
now the question of informed consent is always like a, a difficult one. Um, I think when you talk about, um, you know, supporting a kid to affirm their gender identity in social life, you know, you can do that at any age. Um, when you talk about medical transition, uh, protocol anyway will, will not, you know, I mean, that's not happening before teenager. That doesn't happen. There's nothing happening before tender stage two of puberty. So right. you're not going to have uh, anyone offering any medical kind of formal, like on uh, unchangeable form of transition to a child that is not in an age to make some sort of decision, some sort of informed decision. And then I think it depends on the maturity. I don't think that it's, uh, I think we need to be careful, you know, because, uh, you know, a 12 years old can be super mature, a 14 years old can be immature. So it, it's very difficult. So I think we need to move towards an informed consent model. Um, and, and remember that when they start with some sort of like gender affirming care, such as puberty blockers, these are not uh, irreversible. Uh, you know, they're not irreversible. So the child, the young person can start using almond blockers if they feel like really important gender dysphoria. And then, you know, if after two months they feel that it's not for them, they can stop and there's like no... Uh, there's no effect. It's it's totally reversible. It just put a pause on 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 the development of puberty. Um, then the more semi, you know, semi permanent change you will get with medical transition will be when you start taking hormones such as estrogen and testosterone. But that mm. again is not going to happen before a certain age. You know, normally those young people are not going to access it before 14, 15, sometimes 16 years old, depending on the protocol of the clinic. So again, you know, the young person through an informed consent model will be able to really make an informed decision about how they feel and how, you know, they, uh, how they feel their body needs to align to their uh, gender identity. So uh, it's not a very straightforward answer, but I think there's, you know, I, I don't think that there is one here. I think we just need to kind of follow the child's lead, whatever that age is, and make sure that we have explored with them, not trying to convince them that they're not, you know, of their gender mm -hmm. identity, but just follow them through these kind of pathways that are really complicated. And one last thing I would say is that in that research on clinics, and we're not very far in data analysis uh, when we compare the kids' narrative to the parents' narrative. So these are very, very preliminary stuff I'm telling you there, yeah? Um, but we realized that the parent um, became aware of the gender identity of the kid much later. <laughs> so when we look at the kid's narrative, they talk about it, you know, as being there for a while. And then the parents, when you look at their narrative, they say, oh, it just happened last year. <laughs> so so what, what people from the outside see of a kid is often, you know, the end of an internal process that the kid went through. <laughs> Right. And is ready to kind of, so we need to kind of, you know, the, we'll see next week that maybe the coming out to a parent is the beginning of a journey for parents, but sometimes it's like a stepping stone for the kid who's been like through that for such a long time. Right. Anyway, I yeah. won't. <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, actually, this goes well with, um, somebody was asking too about, you know, you talked about how important it is to foster a gender affirming environment especially I think in places where you have to use ID cards um, and you have to, you know, do traditional forms of identification like that, that may not align with the, the kid's experience. Um, and then some, and then and, and asking you to elaborate on that, but then someone just put, I, this is a really neat concept and I would wonder your thoughts on it. They say, I wondered if there's any groundwork being done um, at national or provincial levels across the care pathway where information technology can be used to create a seamless uh, pathway for the introduction of trans clients to new care providers so that they're not always having to explain their, who they are and their identity to new people along the care pathway. Um, just wondering if you know anything like that or what your thoughts on a, a program like that would be. Well, I think we don't want to add labels where we don't need to add labels, but at the same time, it can be a really helpful thing not to have to repeat everything all the time. So, you know, I think this is the first thing I would say. I think what may be helpful is if there was like uh, some sort of universal uh, medical record, yeah? <laughs> that and, and where on that record, where there's a place where you can put usual name, prefer name and prefer pronoun. 
So I think if you could have a system where you add these two little spots, prefer name, prefer pronoun, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think that would mm -hmm. that would help a lot. Then you need to have the training because it's not because it's written preferred name and preferred pronoun that you will have every helpful social professional who will understand what that means. You know? Mm. So yeah. so so we need to kind of continue to make people aware of gender identity and we need to make people aware that, you know, it can be affirmed very young. But you know, I, I you know, I, we, we don't want, we don't want to have a register. <laughs> we don't want that, but because, you know, obviously it could be used for any, any sort of reason, but I think through, uh, you know, anybody's kind of medical record, if we could just be more flexible in term, we identify ourselves, that could be really helpful for everyone. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Flexibility, individuality, social workers are really you know, totally on board with this idea of honoring lived experience. It's super consistent with, I think, how folks like to practice already. It would be great if our systems could follow suit. Um, we had a couple questions actually about, you mentioned just quickly about um, the rates of intimate partner violence. And I think this just this just was interesting for people. Um, so people are just asking like, I've heard this before and I've never really understood it. Um, are you able to speak to this more? Well. Not a lot, because remember that I do research more on very youth, on youth than adult. Right. And I think those research are more kind of geared towards adult. Uh, I don't think that they are uh, excluding young people, but there's no intimate partner violence on research on young people. So, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be more, uh, I think, hypothesis, what I'm going to say, than anything I've read. But um, we know that there's a lot of, well, Society is still full of transphobia, yeah? There's, there's a yeah. lot of people who are transphobic, who are scared, they don't understand. So you could imagine, uh, you know, a situation in which, you know, a trans person is being abused and violated <laughs> because of their gender identity with someone who either can't cope with their own idea of gender or I don't know. Do you know what I mean? So I can't explain it, but I'm sure it's pretty sure it's related to transphobia uh, mm. in society. Um, there's a lot of murder uh, of, of uh, especially women of color in the United States. Uh, we, we had, you know, in Quebec last year as well, someone who was coming out of uh, um, someone's apartment and they were murdered. Um, you know, th there's a lots of, there's a lots of, of violence of trans people. And I think, you know, whether they are intimate partner violence or, you know, general violence, they, they all, related to transphobia, <laughs> probably. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, this is after you answered the question about um, making sure that you uh, ensure that whatever training you're seeking or whoever you're seeking for advice, knowing what perspective they're coming from. After that, a bunch of people asked if you could recommend some titles like a, for further reading um, mm -hmm. that they could inform themselves about what they actually should be seeking. Yes. So uh, I've, I've, I've added another uh, slide there. So I don't know if you see it is resources. Yep. So there's a few books here that uh, you could access. Well, first of all, there's like the site, the gendercreativekids.ca. Uh, Jeune Trans Youth is like a bilingual site that I'm, I'm maintaining where I'm trying to put the uh, policy documents and uh, there's some fact sheet on that. So you can have a browse. It's not very completed yet because I've started writing that not long time ago, but it, it will become populated soon. But you've got also a, a brand new book by uh, Colt Mayer and uh, Diane Renzaf, which I've cited a lot last week when we we're talking about basic concept, which is called the gender affirming model. So that could okay. be a really good book to start. I've not read the book, but knowing the author, <laughs> I can, you know, I can vouch on, on what's in there. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's absolutely fine, but I've not reviewed it personally, but those two authors are really kind of trans affirming. And then you've got um, uh, another book from uh, some person in uh, British Columbia, The Trans Generation. This is a, a book from Anne Travers, uh, who's a professor yeah. of sociology, who's done a, quite an extensive uh, piece of research on trans youth. So that could be another book. Um, and then there's the uh, Gender Creative Child, uh, another book from Diana Renzaf that will go back into basic concept uh, about uh, gender identity. And there's a book that uh, we co-edited uh, myself and uh, Elizabeth Mayer in Colorado 
uh, on transgender children and uh, youth, supporting them through family schools and communities. So these are four books that, you know, people could uh, probably kind of learn from. Awesome. I think that's really helpful for people. Um, I, I think that this is, uh, knowing that social workers often have like an activist hat on and that we like to make change when we can, this person is asking, and I feel like it's probably coming from personal experience, what would you recommend we do when we work on a team, on an interdisciplinary team with someone, another professional who is not being gender affirmative? Would you have any recommendations for going about addressing that? Ooh. Well, my personal experience is that I like to pull as much evidence and as much policy documents supporting that as possible. I think in social work, we've got like, wherever you are, if you're a member of uh, CASWI, <laughs> you know, there is a policy document about trans youth, uh, which says that, you know, we should affirm them. So I think, you know, as a social worker and, uh, you know, I would say, well, look, you know, ethically, you know, I need to support the trans youth, you know, so now you're asking me to practice here and you don't support. So what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> so I would, I would probably start from my, my, my professional, uh, my professional, uh, posture, my professional um, mm -hmm. deontology and ethics. And then I would draw from uh, other professional associations, you know, like in pediatrics, you know, they, they've got like a really strong policy statement. In sexology, they've got like a really strong policy statement. In psychology, the American Psychological Association has got one. So I think in the end, you know, most professional association whether they are in Canada or in the United States, came out with some really strong policy saying that it's not okay to try to change someone's gender identity and that the affirming model of care is the model that we should be doing because it's what evidence tells us that is the best outcome for young people. So I think that I would try to kind of creep in with those things and, and, and make sure that people are aware of that. And um, yeah. I think that's what I would do because, you know, I mean, oh. evidence is there now, you know, I mean, yeah. 10 years ago, we didn't have evidence that much. We started having evidence, but now, you know, I think we've got lots of strong policy statements. So I think we just need to make them known. Right. Right. Just be, just be knowledge brokers in that way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this will be, I think this is our last question. Um, I, I'm getting the sense that this is from uh, maybe a school social worker or people are just trying to contextualize what they already know about um, certain communities, and they're asking, how do trans youth fit in with uh, the Gay Straight Alliance? Um, what could I say on that? I think there's a piece of research, and I can't I can't cite it because I can't remember where I read that. But I think that to have those spaces where young people can find themselves and discuss is very, very helpful in terms of res you know, resilience. Right. Um, in our Digging Beneath the Surface project, young people told us that to have link and to be related to a community of trans people was very helpful for them. Uh, so I assume that a gay straight alliance would be very helpful as well, even if it's not just kind of trans people there, you know, but Often in gay straight alliance, young people don't even, you know, affirm their identity or sexuality. So I think it's just to have a place where people feel safe and they can, you know, make links with other people. Um, so I would say, you know, I mean, it's about doing it with the young person. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a cis person, you know, I think it's we need to be careful and, you know, not do for mm -hmm. people and just kind of facilitate process. But I think, you know. Uh, to develop something with, if you've got like a trans person, a trans kid in a school and they talk about it, maybe to try to help them to set it up or, or you know, if they don't feel confident doing it, doing it with them. But I think, you know, evidence say that having access to communities is very helpful. So I, I, I see, you know, I think that the Gay Straight Alliance would be extremely helpful for those young people. That's great. Yeah, no. It comes back to, you know, being a good ally is walking with, not leading. Um, I think that's really helpful for people to contextualize where trans youth fit in uh, structures that they're maybe already more familiar with. Um, so I'm looking at the time. It is, uh, it's two o'clock. So we are out of time. Um, 
I have to say another huge thank you to you, Annie, um, or, you know, Dr. Annie poland saint as you're probably known to your students at the University of Montreal. No, 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 um, we don't see that. <laughs> no, never? Just Annie? No, 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 we don't use that title here. We just, no, Madame. <laughs> Okay, my name. There you go. Well, um, and to the audience, thank you for your thoughtful questions and comments. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all. Like, and thank you everyone that's been typing in your thanks for Annie. I will make sure I share all of your comments uh, and your recommendations for books uh, and some of those other resources that people have been sharing with me. I'll share them with her. Um, and I hope that we're going to see all of you for part three, which is of course next week. And um, until then, take care. Thank you.